Guten Morgen allerseits, Grüezi, Buongiorno, Bonjour, Welcome hier auf der Schweizer Botschaft ähm, zu dieser Preisverleihung des Madame de Steyl Preises. I understand that we will have this ceremony in English, so I switch uh, into English. I would also welcome uh, all the guests and friends who are uh, now connected via live stream. Uh, welcome everybody to the Swiss Embassy here in Berlin. Mr. President, uh, dear Helen, dear Tim, distinguished guests, I'm happy to host uh, this ceremony today. Um, it's actually not very um, often that we host such ceremonies. I admit it's my first that I ever hosted. And um, I have to admit as well, I a little bit envy my German and French ambassadors who are able to um, award um, decorations like the Bundesverdienstkreuz or the Legion d'Honneur. In Switzerland, we don't have uh, such decorations. Obviously, it's not a Swiss one, it's an international European one, but nevertheless, we are much too egalitarian for such types of awards. Therefore, it's good to have it taken a higher level to the European level. I will be very short in my introduction. There will be much more interesting speeches to listen to. But I still um, have to say I'm very happy for three reasons that we are able to host this ceremony today. Well, first and foremost, I'm happy for Helen Keller um, for getting uh, this award, which is a very prestigious one. And I understand, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time that a Swiss personality uh, is awarded with that prize. And it's more than deserved, Helen, that you are this first person who gets this award. I happen to know Helen from previous times. We are both lawyers. We are both international lawyers, but obviously she has taken international law to a much higher level than I ever could. And um, I think that's really, again, a great thing that you are uh, receiving that prize today for your great work as a distinguished lawyer, as a distinguished judge at the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg. That brings me to the second reason, which is um, I think it's also good that through you, the work of the European Court of Human Rights and indirectly also the Council of Europe is being awarded and regarded. I have at times the impression that, especially in countries of the European Union, Europe is only seen as the EU, uh, which obviously uh, is important, very much important, but Let's face it, the European Union is certainly a pillar of European integration, but Europe is also much more than only the EU, is also the Council of Europe, and at times I have the impression that it is worthwhile reminding us that the Council of Europe, and especially the European Court of Human Rights, is making an important contribution to human rights, to the rule of law, to cohesion, to society in Europe as a whole. The second and the last reason I'm happy uh, that uh, Helen, as a Swiss personality, is receiving this award is that, and I'm coming now to domestic issue, is that we as Swiss, we are at times struggling. Uh, let's be facing that. We are struggling with international law, uh, with international courts. Uh, the average Swiss is a fiercely independent person, and um, the issue of um, foreign judges is a very delicate topic in my country. Uh, two years ago, we voted um, what we called the so-called Selbstbestimmungsinitiative, which in, in English you would translate in self-determination uh, initiative, which sounds quite nice. Everybody likes self-determination, but it's not about that. It's about self-decision. Uh, the initiative wanted to create a primacy of the Constitution over uh, international law, especially over uh, decisions of the international of the European Court of Justice, and actually, some decisions which the European Court of Justice were taken against Switzerland, some um, cases were the origin of that initiative. Luckily, it was defeated with a two-thirds majority, so reason prevailed. But it just shows the struggle we are having with um, international court decisions or international law generally. Well, we're not the only ones who struggle. Uh, if you look at other countries in Europe, others are struggling even more. And I think um, this award uh, reminds us how important it is to keep on uh, this uh, work for international law, for human rights, 
and the importance of international tribunals to uphold this rule of law uh, and human rights in the whole of Europe. As you may know or may not know, we are also a bit struggling now with our relationship with the European Union in general. Uh, the framework agreement, which was unfortunately, um, for some at least, um, not taken um, any further, uh, is one reason um, for that. And one of the reasons why this um, project did not uh, come to its uh, completion or confusion was also the fact that uh, we would have had in that uh, agreement a arbitration um, accord between Switzerland and the European Union, and some of then in Switzerland didn't like that at all. But this would lead us to a whole other discussion, which uh, obviously is not the topic of today. I'm very much looking forward now to listening after your uh, laud laudatio, Professor and President, to the very topical and interesting uh, discussion and uh, presentation you will be making, Helen, on climate change and human rights. But before that, I would like now to give the floor to you, Mr. Professor, and for the award ceremony, and um, thank you again for being with us. Glad to host the event, and afterwards, obviously, we'll have a moment for a celebration with food and drinks, so let's join us and look forward to all the presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Sehr geehrte Frau Preisträgerin, Professor Keller, sehr geehrter Herr Botschafter der Schweizerischen Eidgenossenschaft in Berlin, meine Damen und Herren, Mesdames et Messieurs, dear colleagues here in Berlin and who are following this event on stream. It is a distinct pleasure and honor to follow Ambassador Sager in welcoming you to this special occasion within the Berlin Science Week. And it is telling precisely in view of our common European values that we are celebrating today this event in a German city, the seat of Alea, a formerly Dutch network of European academies, to celebrate a Swiss scholar who in the course of her distinguished career has studied or worked in many diverse contexts, such as Brugge in Belgium, Harvard, in a new European colony beyond the ocean, Heidelberg in Germany, Oslo in Norway, Strasbourg in France, and since last year, Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is difficult, therefore, to imagine that there is anyone in our continent who does not feel him or herself involved in today's celebration. As many uh, of you probably know, ALEA, the institution I have the privilege to chair, is the European Federation of, Sciences, of Academies of Sciences and Humanities and represents more than 50 research-oriented academies from practically all European countries, both within and outside the European Union. Since its foundation back in 1994, when ALEA emerged as the result of the profound transformations that were beginning to affect the European academic landscape in those years, our network speaks out on behalf of its members on the European and international stage, promotes science and scholarship as a global public good, and facilitates research collaboration across borders and disciplines. In recent years, our focus has been on improving the conditions for European academic research, on providing the best interdisciplinary science advice available, and strengthen the role and of and the trust in science in our European societies. In doing so, ALEA channels the expertise of European academies for the benefit of research, of the research community, of political decision makers, particularly, of course, at the level of the European Commission and of the public at large. Outputs include empirically based science advice in response to societally relevant topics, as well as activities meant to encourage scientific cooperation and to promote what has come to be known as the Enlightenment values through public engagement. 
and precisely as paradigm, some of us would now say benchmark, of its commitment work to the role of science, science I mean here in the general sense of course of German Wissenschaft in shaping Europe, Alea annually awards the Madame de Staal Prize for cultural values to truly outstanding, not just excellent in the sense in which this term is used or misused in current academic parlance, truly outstanding scholars whose work embodies particular contributions to the cultural and intellectual values of Europe. Europe, of course, as the multifaceted, diverse, and open space of human geography that most of us associate with this word since the Greek scholar Herodotus in the fifth century BC, not Europe as the house of violence, oppression, and bigotry, which regrettably it also was, and even more regrettably, sometimes still is. Thus, inspired as it was by the project New Narrative for Europe, initiated by then President of the European Commission, José Manuel Barroso, which aimed to bring new inspiration into the debate on Europe's future, the Madame de Staal Prize stands for an understanding of Europe as a both intellectual and emotional reality, which is constantly enriched precisely, precisely by its diversity and variety of historical and philosophical perspectives. A variety of historical and philosophical perspectives provided the inevitably postmodern thinker in me obliges me to add, provided the multiplicity of approaches remains within the boundaries of an empirical enlightenment-based methodological frame. Today's prize is named after Anne-Louise Germaine de Stahl-Holstein, commonly known as Madame de Stahl, an 18th century noble lady with a curious mind who valued intellectual freedom and education and lived in France and Switzerland, was married to a Swede and dedicated much of her writing to neighboring Germany. I shall not hide from you that naming our prize after a woman who, after all, rather epitomizes the European salon culture of her time, we would say kind of philosophy light, yeah, is not always a crowd pleaser in the scientific world. But our predecessors thought, no doubt correctly, that the fact that Madame de Stahl personally suffered the consequences, uh, the consequences of violence, in this case of Napoleon's persecution, and was forced into exile for many years, definitely qualifies her as a name giver for a prize that very much stresses the values of individual, including academic freedom. Immediate previous laureates of our prize include cultural historian Joop Leersen for the Netherlands, from the Netherlands for his contribution to our understanding of dialectic between the regional and the national dimension in shaping European romanticism and to a certain extent European nationalisms of the uh, 19th and 20th century as a whole. And economist Mariana Mazzucato from the United Kingdom for her focusing her attention on the entrepreneurial rather than purely administrative nature of our modern states in dialectic with a private hand. More uh, pri uh, so prize uh, so representatives were Professor Andrea Peto from Hungary for reminding us that right-wing nationalism, which is still alive and well in our continent, is particularly prone also to gender discrimination and to the president of the European Court of Justice, Kuhn Lenartz from Belgium, one of the founding fathers of European law. This year, the Madame de Staal Prize returns to a juridical personality and recognizes Professor Helen Keller's important contribution to the development and the consolidation of human rights jurisprudence in Europe and for her relentless commitment to each and every human, human being's fundamental rights. In the jury's eyes, and I 
hasten to add that although technically a jury member, as a fellow Swiss, I disqualified myself from expressing an opinion on Professor Keller. Thus, I now only repeat here what, what, what I learned from my colleagues on that occasion. Professor Keller stood out among the dozen suggested candidates this year because she not only excelled in the theoretical and academic field, having led research projects and held teaching positions and research for the past 20 years, but she also greatly contributed to Europe's political and social life, serving at the United Nations Human Rights Committee between 2008 and 2011, on the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg between 2011 and 2020, and on the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina since 2020. Throughout her career, Professor Keller has demonstrated an enduring commitment to tack tackling issues that pertain to human rights in the broadest sense of the term. Her extensive bibliography includes 100 essays, about 20 newspaper articles, about 10 monographs and editorships, and five online publications on issues ranging from democracy to family law, to the death penalty, and of course, environmental and climate justice, which are the main subject of the Climate Rights and Remedies Project, a research endeavor that concerns human rights and climate change that she currently co-leads at the University of Zurich. In this truly transdisciplinary field, which combines two major global challenges, Professor Keller's research is devoted to the impact of adverse effects of climate change on humanity. This is, of course, a critical milestone in safeguarding fundamental rights and calling on the states to take action. As we watch countries and their leaders make pledges to fight climate change at the current COP26 summit, we are particularly happy to recognize through Professor Keller the overall role of science in addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. At a much, much more modest level, ALEA, and I'm proud to say here under the leadership of its youngest member, the German Junge Akademie, has set up its own project in order to explore how academic systems can make the cut to become more climate sustainable without compromising research quality and without jeopardizing international collaboration. Our working group is currently looking into best practices of relevant stakeholders and intends to make recommendations at the European level on how our systems and our individuals working within science and scholarship can best pursue this goal and accompany this transition. If today's event was taking place in Switzerland, which it probably technically is uh, since we are here in the Swiss Embassy, so as someone from Basel, I would have to ritually say that in Professor Keller's impeccable biography, there is only one flaw, and that is that she is a full professor at the University of Zurich. <laughs> this ritual, however, is in this case not only in itself flawed, but also probably sacrilegious, because I happen myself to sit on the board of the University of Zurich. Therefore, I decided to wear today, in our common honor, the University of Zurich tie, lest I be punished for this ritual next time I am in Zurich, which will be the day after tomorrow, precisely like Professor Keller herself. Moreover, Professor Keller's husband is our colleague Ulrich Schmidt, Professor of Russian Studies at the University of St. Gallen, who was an assistant professor at my own university at the beginning of his career, and who is here today together with their children, Matthias and Markus. I greatly, I greet them all very, very warmly. Before turning the floor to Professor Keller for her lecture, 
I would like to thank all those who are here with us today, both on site and in this new locus uh, of our common culture, which is called the virtual space. I would like to thank them for joining Alea's first hybrid event in Berlin this year. We are proud to feature this event as part of the Berlin Science Week. Thanks is, of course, also due to the Embassy of the Swiss Confederation and to Ambassador Sager for kindly offering to host the event, as well as for the, I might add, for the thoughtful remarks themselves already a laudation of sorts he offered us in his greeting message. Professor Keller's talk will be followed by a panel whom I would also like to introduce and to thank. The panel will be chaired and moderated by Professor Bashak Chalil, uh, who teaches international law at the Hertie School of Governance here in Berlin and co-directs the school's Center for Fundamental Rights. On the panel, she will be joined by Professor Felix Eckhart, uh, head of the Research Center for Sustainability and Climate Policy and Professor of Public Law and Legal Philosophy at the University of Rostock, and by Dr. Uh, Adam Levy, Doctor in Atmospheric Physics of Oxford, science journalist and climate communicator, and of course by the laureate herself. We are very grateful to have you here with us today and are looking forward to your discussion. Now, before turning finally the floor to the more scholarly part, there is still this ritual, this far more important ritual, which is the handing over of the prize. Professor Keller, may I ask you to join me on the floor? Thank you so much. Dear Ambassador Sega, dear President Lobrieno, dear friends and family, it is so wonderful that we can come together today, particularly wonderful after this horrible experience with the COVID pandemic. And of course, I'm thrilled by the fact that Alia awarded me the Madame de Style Prize. And I'm particularly thankful to Ambassador Sega that he hosts this event here, that we can celebrate together. And it is great that I can introduce you to some of my thoughts about climate litigation, my new project at the University of Zurich. This year, climate change had a particularly strong impact. Germany was affected by severe flooding in early summer. Canada and Sicily reported record temperatures. Less present in our media was the fact that Madagascar has also been hit by an unprecedented heat wave. Climate change is here. The latest IPCC report makes it very clear. The influence of humans on climate change is scientifically proven and we must do everything we can to prevent a climate catastrophe in the coming decades. In this broader context, in the, it is in this broader context that we must understand climate litigation. This phenomenon is on the rise worldwide. 
Act. Citizens are filing lawsuits against state actors and in some case against private companies, on the grounds that states have done too little to reduce to CO2 emissions. I have structured my presentations as follows. In the first part, I will try to explain why climate lawsuits arise in general and what the common arguments are against courts taking up these lawsuits. Then I'll go over to the pending applications before the European Court of Human Rights. I will show that it is not clear whether the court can declare these applications admissible at all. Finally, in the third and last part, I will try to look into the future and ask if courts do accept climate cases, what significant issue will they have to tackle on the merits? This should provide us with enough material for an exciting discussion. I start with the following question. Why do these climate litigation cases occur before courts? There are several reasons. Many people feel existentially threatened by climate change. They claim that their right to privacy or family life, the prohibition of ill treatment, and ultimately their right to life are being violated. Second, these claimants have the impression that the climate gets too little weight in the political opinion forming process and that the national climate protection laws are shaped too much by short-term thinking and economic interests. Third, in many countries there are no binding standards for climate prote protection. On top of all this, there is another aspect in international level. We have little binding law on climate protection and we have no international body that could verify compliance with these standards. So we do not have an international climate court. In simplified terms, we are confronted with the following situation. Great need for action, low density of normative requirements, and no international institution that could enforce compliance with soft and sometimes hard law standards. As a result, more and more individuals are invoking human rights before national and international bodies in order to combat climate change. This is where it starts to get exciting for me as a former judge of the European Court of Human Rights and as an academic. Because the question arises where the courts are up to this task. In the political and scientific arena, a heated debate has arisen around the question of whether courts should decide these climate lawsuits. What are the common arguments against climate lawsuits? First, courts are not democratically legitimized and therefore should not decide such cases. Second, Human rights are not climate protection rights. Third, there are too many different interests at stake. Courts are overwhelmed by this type of cases. Fourth, climate cases are too complex because the scientific data is so voluminous. And fifth, it is up to the legislative branch to deal with climate change. As to the first argument, courts do have democratic legitimacy and must decide on the complaints that are brought before them. The argument that courts are not a democratic institution is an all-round attack against courts that denies the courts any function. Courts, however, fulfill an indispensable task in the modern state. As for the second argument, this is probably correct. Human rights, especially as they were adopted after the Second World War, 
were primarily intended to protect individuals from state interference. Climate change was not even an issue in the 1950s and 60s. However, all human rights bodies have emphasized that human rights must be interpreted in a contemporary manner and that people must also be protected against new forms of threat. The third argument, argument against climate action also has some merit. Indeed, we are confronted with very different interests when it comes to climate lawsuits. But is that so unusual for courts? No, it is the same in other areas. Think of modern reproductive medicine. There too, a fair solution has to be found between very different interests. The fourth argument is probably true as well. Climate cases are difficult. They demand that the courts take an in-depth look at scientific reports and deal with different data. But this is nothing new. Courts have to do this regularly, for example, in environmental or medical law. And finally, as to the last argument, yes, it is up to the political branches to define solutions for the climate crisis. Fair enough. But what legal steps are possible to individuals who claim that the legislator has not fulfilled its task of protecting them from the effects of climate change? Then the only option is to go to court. My presentation is therefore based on the following premise. Courts have an important, albeit difficult, role to play in tackling the climate crisis. They are walking a tightrope where, on the one hand, they have to assume responsibility for human rights, but on the other hand, they must not make decisions that are too activist, otherwise they endanger their legitimacy. Let's now go on to the second part, access to court in climate litigation, and in particular access to the European Court of Human Rights. Courts do not operate in an empty space, but have to apply the law and in particular obey, obey their own procedural requirements. Today, to date, the European Court has never decided a climate change case. In fact, although the Court has ruled on over 300 cases related to the environment, it has not heard any climate change case on the merits. At present, two climate complaints are at an advanced stage. That means they have been communicated to the parties. The first case is Duarte Agostinos and others versus Portugal and 32 other states. The applicants are six Portuguese youth who assert that climate change has and will continue to impact their lives and health. They claim that the increased frequency and intensity of heat waves in Portugal interferes with their ability to sleep, exercise and spend time outdoors and causes them anxiety about potential impacts both on them and on the families they hope to have in the future. They also contend that because of their age, the interference with their rights are greater than for older generations, not only because they will live longer, but also because the impacts of climate change will worsen over time. The second case is Klima Seniorinnen versus Switzerland. The applicants are a group of older women who argue that, because of their age and gender, they are particularly vulnerable to premature loss of life or severe impairment of life due to climate change-related heat waves. 
They maintain that Switzerland has failed to implement and enforce measures to meet its target under the Paris Climate Agreement, and that this failure significantly increases the risk of heat-related excess mortality among older women. Two other cases have also arrived in Strasbourg. One concerns a young man. He suffers from a specific form of MS that gets much worse when the temperature rises. The second case concerns Norway. Six young climate activists, along with two environmental organizations from Norway, filed an application to bring the issue of Arctic oil drilling to the European Court of Human Rights. These two cases are not yet communicated. This means that these cases are still at the very early stage of proceedings. But you can see there is a whole range of climate cases coming to the court, and these cases are certainly not the last ones. Before the European Court of Human Rights can judge a case on the merits, it must check whether all the admissibility requirements have been met. The most important requirements are listed here. For the non-lawyers, admissibility requirements are important, both in practical and theoretical terms. At the European Court of Human Rights, more than 90% of all cases fail this hurdle. That means that they, they are declared inadmissible. Respecting the admissibility requirements is also important for the legitimacy of the court. These rules are fundamental for the interaction between the court and the member states. The latter must know in advance which case can come before the court. The court will therefore not lightly disregard the admissibility requirements. My talk will focus on three procedural requirements that will pose particular problem to the climate cases. First, exhaustion of domestic remedies. Second, victim status. And the third one, they have to show that they suffered significant harm. The first procedural hurdle is the problem of demonstrating exhaustion of domestic remedies. Exhaustion of domestic remedies is a fundamental principle in international law that requires an applicant to attempt to resolve their issues using domestic legal mechanism before turning to an international tribunal. The Swiss case, Klimaseniorinnen, here the exhaustion requirement is in my view fully fulfilled. The applicants brought proceedings before the Federal Administrative Court and finally before the Swiss Federal Supreme Court arguing that Switzerland has failed to protect them adequately. In the Portuguese case, however, requiring the applicants to first bring their case before the relevant domestic tribunals in all 33 countries concerned appears to have been difficult for the applicant. The applicants argue that the likelihood of every one of the respondent domestic courts providing such a remedy in time to prevent global warming exceeding 1.50 de de uh, degrees Celsius will be greatly enhanced if the court recognizes that the respondents have presumptive responsibility for climate change. So the applicant's main argument is, given the urgency of the issue, they have no time to exhaust the national remedies. Furthermore, requiring applicants to come up with the financial resources needing to fund separate lawsuits in each of the 33 member states would be costly, so costly that this would probably fly 
in the face of the court's case law. The court has repeatedly held that the exhaustion requirement should not impose an unreasonable burden on the applicant. What are the legal avenues if the court wants to make a generous exception to the admissibility requirement? The court's case law in this regard is already well established, though it has not yet been applied in a climate context. There are two exceptions that could be easily transferable. The first exception to the exhaustion requirement arises in cases where the national authorities remain totally passive in the face of serious allegations of misconduct or infliction of harm by state agents. These arguments are most often used in the context of torture or other violations perpetrated by state officials. The exception makes sense in this context. It would be unfair to require applicants to work within a system that is itself responsible for the harm complained of. This same exception should could apply in the climate context. A state's failure to act to avert climate catastrophe and protect people from extraordinary harm should be recognized as serious misconduct. Where a state completely ignores the threat of climate change or where a state's law and politics in fact contribute to climate change, applicants should be exempt from having to comply strictly with the exhaustion requirement. The second exception to the exhaustion requirement arises in cases where a government has adopted a practice that is incompatible with the convention and where proceedings to counter the practice would be futile, ineffective, or constitute an unreasonable requirement. The court has characterized a practice incompatible with the convention as one that consists of an accumulation of identical or analogous breaches which are sufficiently numerous and interconnected to amount not merely to isolated incidents or exceptions but to a pattern or system. Although the exact facts will vary by case, a pervasive system of providing tax breakers, breaks or other benefits to fossil fuel companies or a continued failure to act to reduce a state's carbon footprint, for example, may very well be enough to demonstrate a pattern of violation. This brings me to the first conclusion. On the basis of previous case law, there are exceptions to the exhaustion requirements, but whether these are sufficient to declare the Portuguese case admissible against all 33 states, I dare to doubt. Do we therefore need to rethink the question of exhaustion in climate cases, which is primarily a global problem? I will now turn to the second barrier, the victim status. To be considered a victim, an applicant must be able to show that they were negatively affected by the measure of which they complain. The court applies this criterion in a flexible manner. So long as the applicant has been legally affected, they may be considered a victim. Given this broad definition, individuals, applicants in climate cases who are able to demonstrate that their own rights have been violated will likely not face significant trouble in convincing the court of their victim status. In the Swiss case, the victim status of the senior women is disputed. The government argues that the elderly women are not no more affected by global warming than anyone else. This question of victim status is therefore not easy for the court to answer in this case. And we not only have the individual senior 
women applying to the court in this case, but also an association that advocates for the rights of the Klimaseniorinnen, or female climate seniors. The question is whether this association has victim status as well. Environmental groups may have uh, may have even more difficulty convincing the court that they qualify as victims. However, there are good reasons why the court should recognize environmental groups standing to bring climate cases as well. The court's case law is not absolutely clear on this issue. However, there are isolated cases where the court has granted victim status to environmental associations. And I think the court should build on this case law and develop it. The court has long held that victim status may be granted to an organization that is directly affected by a particular government measure. But an organization may also be accorded victim status on the circumstances where individuals who are negatively affected can best confront the problem by forming an association. This was the case in Gorais, Lizarago, and others versus Spain. In that case, multiple individuals came together to form the Coordinadoro de Itois Association to resist the construction of a dam that would lead to flooding of several small villages. The flooding would have resulted in the expropriation and population displacement. The court considered the Coordinadoro de Itois Association to have victim status. And the court said, I quote, in modern day societies, when citizens are confronted with particularly complex administrative decisions, recourse to collective bodies, such an association, is one of the accessible means, sometimes the only means available to them, whereby they can defend their particular interests effectively. Reinforcing this position, the court has also emphasized that the term victim in the convention must be interpreted in an evolutive manner in the light of conditions in contemporary society. The wording of the convention is very open. There is nothing in the text, text of the convention itself that precludes a group from bringing a claim. Finally, would an application by an environmental organization be tantamount to an actio popularis? As far back as the European Commission's decision in Becker versus Denmark in 1975, the European human rights system has signaled a deep aversion to acciones popularis. This aversion has continued into the present. But not every case that is brought by a group is an actio popularis. Applicants may be victims within the meaning of the convention, even if their interests align with the interests of the general public. This brings me to my second preliminary conclusion and several follow-up questions. Victimhood is a real challenge in climate cases, both for individuals and organizations. Do we need to redefine the concept of victimhood for global human rights problems that potentially affect everyone? Will there be certain groups in future who are particularly legitimized to bring climate applications to the courts because of their vulnerability? Let us go to the third barrier, significant disadvantage. Within the sphere of the convention, a significant disadvantage means that the violation complained of attains the minimal level of severity needed to war warrant consideration by the court. 
for those applicants who bring claims stemming from climate-related harms that have already occurred, demonstrating a significant disadvantage is unlikely to present an issue. Indeed, the court has only declared a very limited number of cases inadmissible because of this criterion. Does applicants bring in climate change cases based on allegations of past or current harm, including the elderly women in the Swiss case, will likely be able to satisfy this requirement with relative ease. But this requirement may present a much more significant challenge for applicants who attempt to bring cases based on a theory of future harm rather than current or past harm. The court has historically been reluctant to hear cases where an applicant's complaint is based only on the risk of future violations. However, there are two arguments in favor of allowing cases centered on a risk of future harm. The first is that there is some precedence for allowing these sorts of cases. And the second is that the significant disadvantage requirement may be bypassed if doing so is in, to, is in the interest of protecting human rights. Turning first to the issue of precedence, the court has, under some circumstances, allowed cases to proceed even if the allegations concerned potential future harm. The first example is Tashkin versus Turkey. The applicants complained that the gold mine's proposed use of sodium cyanide to extract the ore would threaten the surrounding environment and ultimately the applicant's health and safety. Although these claims were based only on a hypothetical, though probable, future risk, the court declared the case admissible and found a procedural violation of Article 8. The case of Enrildis versus Turkey also provides some precedence in this area. In Enrildis, the applicants had suffered the loss of nine close relatives due to an explosion at the refuse site that the Turkish government had failed to adequately maintain. The court concluded that there had been a violation of Article 2 in its procedural aspect in this case. Importantly, the court supported this conclusion by noting that only the lack of ad adequate safeguards of the right to life for the individuals who were killed but also because there were no safeguards in place, and I quote, quote, there were no safeguards in place to avoid in similar life endangering conduct in the future. It is reasonable that the court should take a similar approach in cases related to climate change. As long as the applicants make an arguable claim that they are very likely to suffer harm, the court should accept the, applicants as, the applications as admissible. All other considerations, including questions of attribution or establishing a direct causal link, should be joined to the merits. The second argument in favor of allowing applicants concerning future harms to proceed, the court must hear a case if respect for human rights requires an examination of the applicants on the merits, even if the case does not otherwise meet the requisite significant disadvantage. This is the exact situation that is likely to arise in a number of climate change cases. The harm that the applicants themselves have experienced may not reach the significant disadvantage threshold, but the importance of the question they raise may nonetheless require the court to hear the case. 
This brings me to my third preliminary conclusion. The requirement of significant damage might be a problem for all climate cases in which the applicants argue that the damage arises in future. But the court should find a solution to solve this admissibility on the basis of existing case law. I hope that I have been able to show to you with these ex explanations that national and international courts are being challenged in climate cases. The devil lies in the proverbial details of many admissibility requirements. For the European Court of Human Rights, this means that it has to set new standards for various admissibility requirements in the light of the climate crisis. This is possible, but the court must, must handle these questions carefully so that the Strasbourg judges cannot be accused of activism. I have tried to give you an overview of possible admissibility questions in the two first climate cases pending before the court. However, there are many more questions to be resolved in climate cases in the future, such as is who may file applications on behalf of future generations? Is there a historical responsibility of the industrial countries that the court must take into account in the balancing of interests? Is there an intertemporal dimension of climate justice as well as an interlocal one can people in other regions of the world invoke the lack of climate protection measures in Europe? Who do we define, how do we define jurisdiction in the meaning of Article 1 of the Convention for a problem that is interlinked globally? Do we have to recast the principle of equality and the prohibition of discrimination so that we can create climate justice. There is still a long way to go for the courts on the national and international level. Let's hope that the courts will soon tackle these issues and decide them wisely. In any case, we will have enough material in our research project for the analysis of the court's dimension in climate change. I thank you so much. Hello everyone, joining us here at the uh, Swiss Embassy in Berlin and also all of those uh, joining us uh, online uh, today. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here and to have listened to your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, once again. Um, my name is Başak Çalıl. I'm a professor of international law at the Hertie School and I also co-direct the Center for Fundamental Rights uh, at the Hertie School. Perhaps I have three reasons for you know, finding this an absolute honor and also an absolute pleasure to be moderating the panel that we have today. So my first reason is I'm a longtime admirer of the scholarship of Professor Helen Keller, um, as I'm a scholar of international human rights law and the European Court of Human Rights myself. And I'm also a big admirer of her uh, due to her work that she has done on the bench of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I would warmly recommend everyone uh, to also read Helen Keller's uh, very famous dissenting opinions that she wrote on, on some very important uh, judgments at the European Court of Human Rights as well. The second reason is that um, at the Herti Center for Fundamental Rights, we focus on um, current and future challenges to the protection of fundamental rights and responses of laws and institutions to those challenges. Um, we focus on four of these challenges. Uh, one is new forms of authoritarianism. The second one is new technologies. 
Uh, the third is asylum and migration. And fourth is the climate crisis. So I'm absolutely delighted also to represent this research interest that we have uh, in this conversation. Now, the third reason is I'm going to be joined by an excellent panel uh, imminently. And this is the third reason why I'm really excited uh, to be here today. So I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists uh, to you very briefly, and then I will invite them to come to the panel, to the stage to join us uh, as well. Um, let me introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist is Professor Felix Eckhardt. Uh, Professor Felix Eckhardt is the head of the Research Center for Sustainability and Climate Policy at the University of Leipzig, and he founded this center in 2009. He's also a professor of public law and legal philosophy at uh, Rostock University uh, as well. Uh, Professor Felix Eckhardt's um, interests, both as a lawyer, or not both, I have to maybe change it, as a lawyer, philosopher, and a sociologist, lies at issues around human rights and sustainability studies. Uh, he also edits a very important collection uh, with Springer Nature on environmental humanities, transformation, governance, ethics, and law, and also contributions to social science sustainability research with Metropolis Publishing. Perhaps something more interesting and important for the discussion that is coming up is that Professor Eckhart represented the 2018 constitutional complaint by an alliance of Solar Energy Support Association, Friends of the Earth uh, Germany, and many individual plaintiffs uh, before the German Constitutional Court. Uh, and no doubt we will be hearing about uh, the, uh, this case and how it links to some of the discussions that Professor Helen Keller introduced to us in short time. So please join us, Professor Eckhart. It's wonderful to have you here with us. So let me introduce our second panelist uh, for today. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Adam Levy. Uh, Dr. Adam Levy uh, holds an undergraduate in physics and a doctorate in atmospheric physics, uh, both from the University of uh, Oxford. Adam is an award-winning science journalist, and uh, he communicates science and climate through a range of media, including writing, film, and podcasts, as well as YouTube. Um, he has a very famous YouTube channel called Climate Adam. And if you haven't uh, seen some of his uh, postings, uh, I would really warmly recommend you to check it out as, as soon as possible. Um, Adam has worked also for a number of publications, including Scientific American, PBS, uh, and Nature. And his work has received a lot of recognition and awards uh, as well. It's wonderful to welcome you to the panel, Adam. So how are we going to run this? Um, I uh, assume that everyone has a lot of questions, so I'm really encouraging those who are online to, to type up their questions in uh, the medium, and I will have access to some of these questions over here. I have a little laptop uh, to check them, and I'm sure there are lots of questions from the audience. But just to also give you a little bit of time maybe to, to think through those questions, I'd like to just kick off uh, with a few of uh, questions myself. Uh, my questions are going to focus on some of the challenges that Professor Helen Keller identified, and maybe we can dig a little bit deeper into the challenges that she identified at the beginning of the lecture. So if I could just first turn to you, um, Adam, uh, with my first question. Um, Professor Kellen identified that, you know, how do courts deal with science, uh, scientific complexity, in judicial making, and she highlighted this as, as one, of the, one of the challenges. Um, what is your take on this? Uh, you know, is science really so complex? Uh, could lawyers, judges, uh, courts, they would be unable to understand or process what science offers, in particular in, in this cause and effect uh, type of questions that individual claimants uh, have to prove before courts? I think in general, science, um doesn't pose a challenge necessarily in this regard, but then let's talk specifically about climate science and what climate science shows us and how that fits into the court. Um, so I think traditionally when we think of a, a, you know, a classic court case, we think of an individual or a group of individuals who've suffered harm 
in some quantifiable way or definable way thanks to some other individual or some other group of individuals. And it feels like we want to be able to draw some kind of straight line in that case. Um, and what we have in climate science is we have a real spider's web. Um, we have uh, often a difficulty in clearly defining, OK, this is the group of victims, and often also difficulty clearly defining who the, uh, the people who have caused harm are. Um, which is not to say we can't say uh, what causes harm or what kind of harms are caused, but neatly defining those groups and drawing boundaries around them, I think, can be very challenging. Um, now, there's been huge progress in this area in climate science within the last few years. So um, in the field of um, attribution, for example, attribution of extreme weather events, where we can look at a particular extreme weather event that's taken place and say it was this much more severe because of human actions, or it was this much more likely because of human actions. Um, similarly, we can attribute uh, the changes to the climate to emitters um, to different levels. So I don't think this is an insurmountable problem, but we are to some extent dealing with a, uh, a square peg in a round hole, I think. Um, and I think with good, good engineering from both lawyers and climate scientists, you can make this square pe peg fit in the round hole, but I do think it presents a challenge. There are also other challenges that you come up, up across, I think, for example, the challenge of uncertainty, which is just fundamental to all of science and um, doesn't, as some people might think, mean we don't know. It means here the limits of our knowledge. Um, so, for example, uh, a really fundamental question in climate science is how much will the world warm for a certain amount of carbon dioxide? Um, and the answer we get is um, that if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would likely warm between 2.6 and 3.9 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And um, that uncertainty is really important to science. It tells us a lot. I worry that that uncertainty could be a hard thing to communicate and uh, to incorporate into court cases where you perhaps want to more clearly be able to define the situation and uh, define harms. The third and final point I'd like to bring up is maybe not one about the science itself, but what happens to the science. Um, we have seen over the last years, over the last decades, incredibly successful campaigns to delegitimize the scientific research and to derail and destabilize policy based on our scientific understanding. Um, and these campaigns have, have been incredibly successful. Um, you can see that based on the fact that emissions have continued um, pretty much on track for what would have happened if we hadn't even known there was a crisis. Um, my concern is, as well, that these kinds of disinformation campaigns could find their way somehow into courts. Um, I don't know whether they could find their way so easily into courts as they can into politics, but certainly it's a risk that I think needs to, to be considered. So in these ways, I think, uh, yeah, getting the, the science into the courts does present a challenge, but I certainly hope it's not an insurmountable one. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you a bit later, um, Helen, as well, uh, to reflect on some of these points. But um, let me turn uh, to you, um, Felix, on one of the other uh, challenges uh, that we uh, listened from uh, Professor um, Helen Keller. And this was about whether international courts, in particular um, the European Court of Human Rights, was best placed to get into uh, litigation of climate crisis through human rights claims. Um, there are lots of other candidates. Uh, some say that domestic courts are better, and I know that you have this experience uh, with the uh, case in, in Germany. Uh, some say that um, you know the parliaments are better placed, or some just say the UNFCCC. You know the you know that there are other international organisations. Um, what, what, what is your take on this um, uh, challenge that was identified as who is best placed? Well, I'd, I'd like to take the question back to what is liberal democracy really about in terms of climate change. Liberal, liberal democracy is about balancing different, as, as I'd like to call it, I wouldn't call it interests, I'd like to call it different spheres of freedom, um, including rights to freedom, rights to the very preconditions of freedom, such as life, health and subsistence, and also 
other arrangements that in a way also promote our, our autonomy, such as social policy, etc. And with regard to climate change, this means there's a need for balancing, for instance, the rights of consumers and enterprises on the one hand, and the, uh, the rights of literally everybody to life, health and subsistence as a precondition of freedom, including people uh, um, belonging to future generations and people living in other countries. This um, takes us to some leeway and the way um, um, for filling this leeway we developed in, uh, in Western history is electing parliaments because this is a freedom friendly way because if we don't like the way they balance we can vote them out of office. And the rule of constitutional courts, in my opinion the European Court of Justice and also the European Court of Human Rights are also kind of constitutional courts. The rule of these courts is not to replace um, parliaments, their rule is also not to replace um, transnational uh, legislative procedures like within the framework of the UNF UNFCCC. The, their role is to make the framework clear, to say, okay, where are the limits to balancing? And in my opinion, as a lawyer and philosopher, and this is also what we presented to the German Federal Constitutional Court that uh, gave us, in, in the end, the pro probably most ambitious a climate verdict by a Supreme Court on worldwide scale this spring. Um, I, I prepared it for 20 years in my, in my research. Uh, the, what the court did is uh, uh, they accepted we can derive uh, certain uh, balancing limits or balancing rules from the, from the, from the relevant uh, freedom rights or uh, precondition rights, for instance, a rule that the, the, the way parli parliaments balance things um, doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be, or, or mustn't be biased. Yeah? There is just a limit. It, it's unfair, for instance, to consume all remaining possible greenhouse gas emissions within, within a very short time frame. And this is a point where a court can say, okay, stop. Um, the parliaments have to reframe their legislation. It's not the rule of a court to be a kind of king and to replace um, climate policy. For instance, to say, okay, you have to stop completely new policy instruments tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And what, also, what is also important and what, uh, what is also in, in a way part of what I would like to call balancing rules from, from a legal theoretical perspective. Lawyers also have, have other um, uh, wordings for that, for instance, principle of proportionality, but they are sometimes hard to understand for, for, for non-lawyers. What is also important, uh, they have to make sure the parliaments keep to um, um, some procedural requirements, for instance, and this is also what, what the German court made clear, that the most important decisions in terms of climate policy are conducted by the parliaments and not by the governments. And what is also important, and this takes me back to, back to what Adam said, is that the parliaments have to be accurate in terms of natural scientific data. Uh, the German court um, read the IPCC reports very well. The only bad uh, point uh, regarding this is they didn't, uh, if I may say that, uh, understand the criticism on IPCC reports we presented. They even said we didn't present it, but we did. Uh, yeah, this was a kind of compromise, of, obviously. What I mean is the IPCC is not a kind of eco-radical NGO. It just re uh, represents a minimum consensus on what they do when they calculate, uh, calculate a budget is uh, that they sometimes, um, even in my opinion, in my humble opinion, uh, violate uh, some legal framework. For instance, if we have the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit in international law in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, and the German Federal Constitutional Court accepted this is binding at least in international law, uh, we cannot accept a budget that calculates to stay within the, this limit only with a 50-50 probability. But the German Constitutional Court said this is fine. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, we have a lot of questions from our online audience. 
uh, coming up. So I'd like to combine one of the questions that we, we received from uh, Prana Afghanistan uh, with, uh, with, with uh, some of the discussions you had on exhaustion of domestic remedies. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll uh, ask you, Adam, a question and then uh, mm -hmm. if you could follow up on, 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 the, on the question as well. So uh, one very famous human rights litigation uh, happened just a few weeks ago, was before the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, where the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, that the 16 children did not exhaust uh, the domestic remedies. So their application was declared inadmissible, something that was also highlighted in Professor Keller's discussion of the European Court of Human Rights um, case law at the moment. So Adam, one of the things that the 16 children uh, said before the United Nations uh, was that they had no time to exhaust domestic remedies. They said this is an urgent matter. If we did go to um, courts in uh, Argentina, Brazil, in Turkey, and what have you, this will take decades, you know, 10 years or more, and science says that this is urgent and that lawyers should respond to it. Could you give us a more of a climate science perspective on the children's urgency argument? Yeah, I think, um, and um, Professor Eckhart brought this up, but um, uh, the international community has agreed to limit global warming well under two degrees Celsius, ideally under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, every country in the world um, is signed up to the Paris Agreement, I think except the Vatican. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so this is, uh, that's not a scientific point, that's what the international community has done, but the scientific justification for that is that beyond those temperature limits, the impacts of climate change will uh, become much more severe. In many cases, the threats will become existential. Um, so beyond 1.5 degrees, once we get to, for example, just two degrees of global warming, um, we will see um, small uh, low-lying island nations no longer uh, viable. You know, nations wiped out is what we're talking about. Uh, we'll look at a future um, without coral reefs in this planet. Um, and that is an impact that's expected at two degrees, which we would reach if we continue on our current trajectory within a matter of decades. This isn't a future we're leaving our children or grandchildren. It's a future that, if we're not careful, um, you know, most of us will see. Um, so that's the situation we're in. And the international community came together and said, OK, we absolutely have to do something about it, limit global warming to under two degrees, or ideally under 1.5 degrees. And, um, and the latest IPCC report, um, which came out just a few months ago, looks at different scenarios um, of how emissions could, uh, could change in the future, which come from the very, um, I guess you could say, nihilistic to the, I guess you could say, wishful thinking. And even this wishful thinking scenario actually gave a less than 50% chance of staying under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think the... Um, uh, it, it projected crossing 1.5 degrees before returning under it. So we're right on the limit of what is seen as, as feasible to stay under this limit that the international community has agreed is important and would keep us to some degree safe. Um, and so coming back to your question, is this urgent? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it would have been... Uh, I, th I think exactly the same point would have been valid 10 years ago, you know, do we need to act incredibly rapidly? Mm -hmm. And we did, and we didn't. Um, and so the urgency now really can't be overstated. Let me turn to you, um, Helen, on this question. So uh, the audience uh, question uh, from Ghanistan says, well, should we not just do away with this requirement for climate crisis case cases then, the exhaustion of domestic remedy rule, if it takes a decade for a child to go through their country's uh, legal systems? Let me uh, first say something to the decision. You know, it was the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and the most prominent child or youngster was Greta Thunberg. They, she pushed together with other um, youngsters this uh, communication, and it was uh, expected very much. And you said it was declared inadmissible. Yes, but read the decision. It is a great decision 
on victimhood and jurisdiction. If this will be the future standard on these two issues, then we have gained a lot with this decision. Now, coming back to exhaustion, what was the problem? They, the children, the youngsters, they haven't tried anything in any country. And in the meantime, we have very positive national decisions from the Netherlands, Urgenda, from Germany, and the Committee of the Rights of the Child referred to this successful decision and said, well, look, you have to try because this is the law. And once again, this interaction between the national level and inter the international level, the, the rule of the game is exhaustion. And you can try hear something and hear something and then come and say, it's impossible. But if you do nothing, nothing, then it becomes really difficult for an international body which has to obey, obey the law. We cannot redefine, it's written in the treaty. Then it is difficult to say, we just overcome this requirement this would endanger the whole system. Okay, so um, I think that's a no answer. I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard about this. So we have a lot of uh, questions coming up here. Um, and I want to also combine uh, some of this uh, uh, with, with the discussions that we're having. Uh, one very important feature that you highlighted with the Portuguese case is that the, uh, this time the Portuguese children are taking the case against 33 yes. different Council yes. of Europe member states. So I'd like to kind of come back on a round and maybe start with you, Felix. So uh, is that a very difficult thing for the court? Because given that states have historically contributed differently um, to the climate crisis. So is this, again, a very risky strategy that kids are, are not going after their own governments, but actually uh, other countries uh, in their failures to act? Well, of course, uh, generally speaking, climate change poses various di distri uh, distributive issues uh, with regard to mitigation, adaptation, and loss of damage. We see different capabilities of different states. We see different um, roles in terms of uh, historical causation, uh, which is in a way uh, an issue of the polluter pays principle, which in itself follows um, basic principles of liberal democracies, because when you um, when you are a, f a free person, you also have to accept that you are held accountable for what you're doing, for the consequences, also for the negative consequences. And if we uh, take these principles into account, it um, sounds um, convincing to find distributive rules that, for instance, take us to the result that Western countries um, um, bluntly speaking, pay more and, uh, for what we have to do in terms of climate protection, uh, protection in the years to come. But as regards courts, I'm not so sure if these issues really matter here, because um, given that the, there's an internationally binding 1.5 degrees Celsius limit uh, in the Paris Agreement, given that something like that is, uh, also has a fundament in, in constitutional human rights or in human rights in general due to the fact that there is um, a leeway for balancing different spheres of freedom but that for instance one limit to balancing is that it is illegal to put the vital basis of uh, future balancing at risk and this is what may happen if we proceed on in terms of climate change uh, the way we used to do. Given all, uh, given that and given that uh, there is a need to at least try, try to, st uh, to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit, um, the obligation of all states in the EU, etc., is to meet a zero emission line as soon as possible. There is no uh, 
real need to uh, discuss distribution in this point. Yeah? So if, if you see, I don't know, 30, uh, 33 states, the answer is all the same. Yeah? They need uh, to, to, uh, to take it to zero as soon as possible. And the question is just, and this is a question of balance of powers once again, um, can we derive an exact answer from balancing rules in terms of budgets and zero emission years? Can a constitutional court say you have to meet a zero line in 2035 or 2033? I'm pretty sure um, 2050 is, is insufficient. Yeah, this is what you said in the end. There are scientists um, that say, like, like you did, there is no budget left at all. I think that was a yes, right? Uh, so we had a... We're disappointing we a, we you all yes the time. We're so sorry. <laughs> uh, I'd like to also look at the audience uh, here in the, in the Swiss Embassy. We have uh, a lot of questions on the chat that I'd like to come to, but would anyone like to ask a question uh, to um, any of our panelists um, or to Professor Keller at this stage? Um, I have a question at the back. Yes, please. Um, yeah, you mentioned the problem with uh, democratic legitimacy, and I, I see that often this kind of tension between technocratic and democratic approaches, or be between the scientifically established existential urgency and the slow democratic political processes. And uh, a court in Lausanne in Switzerland has uh, decided in 2020 that one of those climate necessity cases. Um, has also made reference to the slow political democratic process and that, that basically doesn't match onto the urgency anymore. But then again, of course, as lawyers, we, we cannot just be committed to climate emergency and climate urgency, but yeah, as you said, there is laws, there is, there is rules. So how do you reconcile those two conflicting values? Thank you, thank you very much. Would you like to uh, respond to that? I think there are not conflicting values. I think the different branches in a democratic state, in a liberal democratic state, have to work together. And if parliament passes laws, they of course have to consider IPCC reports. They have to consider how they will reach the CO2 remission, uh, reduction um, goals, and they will have to interact with experts. And I think this is the same for courts. And courts will invite experts and will try to learn from them. And one of the question in our research project is, what do we see, how do courts deal with that issue? And if I may take the example of the German Constitutional Court, who decided in this summer, and the Swiss Federal Supreme Court, who decided on the Klima Seniorinnen. The approach is completely different. While the German court went into details and we have a judgment of 200 pages and you feel how they sweated with all those reports and try to understand and try to, uh, to find a solution. The Swiss Federal Supreme Court, you know, it's a very short decision, no standing. The, the Switzerland has enough time to solve the problem it is up to the parliament, you know, there are different planets that those two courts are on. And this is one of the questions, how can we explain that highest courts in different countries, but they're not so different, Switzerland and Germany, what makes the difference and how can we engage judges in going into deeper in this exercise, which is certainly needed. If you close the eyes, you will not find a good solution, whatever you decide. May I add two very yes, small please. points on this? Yes, please. Uh, the first one is, uh, as a philosopher, um, as regards your, your, um, your fight between uh, how, how you call it technocracy and democracy, um, my general answer is um, 
it would be an is odd for this fallacy if natural scientists would make political decisions. They can just pro provide data. Political decisions, as I mentioned earlier, are about balancing different aspects of freedom and the rule of constitutional courts, or more or less constitutional courts, is defining limits. Um, and uh, the second aspect, um, as regards the German Federal Constitutional Court, you, you are very kind, Helen, uh, with regard <laughs> to these judges. Uh, to be honest, they made some, uh, uh, some very obvious mistakes with the natural scientific data. Not only that they didn't discuss all the criticism, uh, they, for instance, they also they wrote that um, almost no greenhouse gas emissions are bound by oceans. Yeah, and this is so obviously flawed. And just it was was the climate skeptics that they told that that brought it to the media and said, okay, they did, obviously didn't understand some basic facts of climate science. Do you want to come in on this uh, point, Adam? I'm, I think you captured it. I don't know the details of the. Um, you the can book. read it up. Yeah, <laughs> in both English, German, French, whatever you want. Sure. But no, but it's so interesting that you started with highlighting this uh, risks of misinformation and disinformation of science communication in, in courts. Uh, yeah, and I well. think, of course, we hope that courts would be somehow immune to that, but I've yet to see a sect of society that has proven immune to misinformation when it comes to climate change. And uh, so, yeah, I definitely fear that... Uh, it could already has been a problem in, in verdicts. Ambassador, would you like to pose a question? Yeah, well. I misused my privilege of being the host of asking, for asking a question. I, I would like to come back to what, what Helen mentioned at the end of her speech concerning Article 1 of the Convention, the, the jurisdiction, uh, but because the high contracting party have uh, pledge to protect their human rights within their jurisdiction. That's what the convention says. Now, global warming, we all know, is a global phenomenon. And the question is then, how far can you then pinpoint the national responsibility on human rights matters in regard to this global warming? Because governments could then easily say, well, you know, we are doing what we can, but the Chinese are the big polluters, or the Americans are the big polluters. We are not. So I would go along with uh, Felix Eckhart saying if a government does not at all implement um, the 1.5 uh, degree which they have pledged to, that is a violation of international law, which you could also, from my point of view, uh, use an argument in, in a human co rights court. But let's, let's take the example we had recently in Switzerland. You know, The government came up with a revision of the CO2 law which unfortunately I have to say personally, I don't say that as an ambassador, but I just said as a person, was voted down by the population. So, you know, how do we deal with a situation where the government is trying to do its best efforts, but finally is not, it's not working, it's not enough? Is that really a case where you can still, under Article 1, claim that jurisdiction is relevant? I have a question on that. Thank you. Shall we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let's explain the jurisdictional issue for the non-lawyers -lay here. It is a broader issue. Let's take the example that you have a person from Nepal claiming that Switzerland or Germany has done too little in reducing CO2. And because the, those European countries are doing too less, this person suffers extreme harm in Nepal. This is the jurisdictional issue. We have several conceptions that we see. The German constitutional court said, well, we accept in the first stage those complaints from those you know, persons far away from Germany. I doubt whether the Swiss Federal Supreme Court would do the same, but if the, once the case comes to the European level, the European Court of Human Rights has a quite strict jurisprudence which takes the wording of Article 1 and is a strictly territorial application. This is completely different uh, if we compare it with the Inter-American Court, it's completely different if we compare it with 
the Human Rights Committee. Those human rights bodies have a cause effect understanding. So if in Germany you have the cause and the effect or vice versa, those jurisdiction would say Article 1 is fulfilled, not the European Court of Human Rights. And let me say something from a former judge. The European Court is flooded by applications from Russia, from Turkey, and the court is fighting for decades to get the backlog down. So I doubt that the court will open the jurisdictional issues in order to have climate cases coming from Nepal, from Africa, from Latin America. I think that's not what the court wants. But the question remains, jurisdiction is an issue and will be an issue in climate cases because it's such a global problem, globally interlinked. Ashok, may I add something on that or do we are running out of time? Um, yes, I think we have a little bit of more time, but um, I think Adam, you wanted to come in and then I'll, I'll yeah, turn sure. to you, um, um, Felix. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to come to the point um, regarding this argument that we come across a great deal in lots of different spheres. Uh, you know, uh, why should we do something when China continues to emit or India continues to emit or America continues to emit? The scapegoat changes, but the argument remains the same. Um, so just in a fundamental way, how climate change works is uh, the more carbon dioxide we emit as a planet, the hotter the world gets. Uh, the world will stop getting hotter when we stop emitting carbon dioxide overall. So the more we pump into carbon dioxide, uh, the more we pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, whoever that we is, and however much carbon dioxide we're pumping, the more we're heating the planet. So as long as Germany is uh, emitting carbon dioxide, uh, Germany is causing the planet to get hotter than it otherwise would be, and causing harms worse than they otherwise would be. Um, to come up with a bit of a gruesome analogy, um, uh, imagine a gang of people kicking someone on the ground and, uh, and then in court someone says, well, I was only kicking this person in the shins, but China was kicking them in the head. Of course, yeah, China should not have been kicking this person in the head, but you also shouldn't have been kicking them in the shins. Thank you so much for, for that explanation. <laughs> I think that was, that was fantastic. Felix, please. Well, um, first of all, um, I strongly feel that many people in Europe forget that we are still uh, among the countries with the highest per capita emissions in the world. Yeah, we have a lot of talk, yeah, like nice talks and a lot of legislation, etc. But in the end, uh, we live very well. Yeah, a lot of going by car, going by plane, etc. And and I also have to disappoint you, to be honest, dear Adam, from behavioral sciences. We know pretty well that factional knowledge very often changes literally. Uh, um, nothing with regard to that because human beings follow other other incentives, other aspects of motivation, for instance, self-interest or conceptions of normality, past dependencies, emotions such as scapegoating, um, habits, uh, convenience, etc. But let, let me make my other, uh, my other point um, the, uh, on the German case. The German Federal Constitutional Court um, provided a very strange construction to, uh, with the result that on the one hand they accepted that human rights have an intertemporal and cross-borders dimension. They didn't follow the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice saying that even if you bump another state, that's no jurisdiction yeah, of the state, which I personally find kind of strange. Uh, they said yeah, of course, there is this encroachment, but in the end, what is most problematic in terms of freedom um, with regard to climate is not climate change itself, that it is not avoided, but 
um, what is most important is that first of all we neglect climate policy and then everything is happening very fast. We pass very strict climate laws um, very fast and this will be the most important encroachment to our freedom. This is a very classic liberal way of dealing with the climate crisis. In my opinion, the most the more dangerous aspect of climate change is climate change itself because it will take us to wars on resources, wars on water, huge migration movements, and this sounds a lot more dangerous with regard to freedom to me than uh, that someone tells me you are not allowed to fly. Uh, anymore. And this is really strange, but the intention behind, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, is that what you said, Helen, the court wanted to avoid the result that literally everyone in the world can go to the German constitutional court, because then they could, uh, they could say now, oh, given that climate policy and not climate change is the most dangerous thing for our freedom. Well, people in Bangladesh or Nepal are, are, are not, not subject to German legislation, so never mind. Thank you. Helen, I think you want to come in on this again? Yes. Please? In the Urgenda case, the government argued, argued, well, if we do here something, you know, this is just a drop in the ocean. It would not change anything. And the Supreme Court of the Netherlands rejected that argument completely and said, well, we have a shared responsibility. And what the other countries do is not important. You government have to be sure that you do everything under the convention to ensure that people will be safe for, from climate change. And this argument or the rejection of this argument is just a drop in the ocean. This is for me a very good example of court's language that hopefully will, used, will be used in other cases around the world. Thank you very much. Um, I think I would like to pick up one uh, online question and one from the audience as well before uh, we try to come to the close of an opening discussion. I think we will have to uh, discuss further because what's also, Adam, you highlighted is that we also have to think about the legal concepts and whether the concepts we have are useful. And one of this is this infamous concept of jurisdiction. I think your example says this concept is not useful to make sense of, um, of the climate crisis in some ways. I have one question from our audience. Anna Peters is asking Helen you a question, uh, and I'd like to uh, come to you on this. So she says, all three barriers you, um, Helen, mentioned in your talk relate to the role of the court as an institution to furnish only subsidiary and individualized justice. So she asks, should this role be rethought in the direction of a more constitutional, uh, or in other words, more general structural role, less focused on securing the rights of individuals uh, um, facing a global emergency? Um, what would you say on this question? It's a very good question. I think the problem is how do we understand climate change and climate litigation. Is it rather a question of individuals bringing a claim and claiming their individual rights? Or is it rather a distribution problem? The court is constructed to ensure individual rights if the national courts have failed to do so. And obviously, this is what the climate litigation cases try now to go. But the underlying problem is a distribution problem, a much broader problem. But I'm not sure that the court is able and willing to change from that traditional individual rights approach court with a subsidiary role to go to something else which is more than a constitutional court's role, then the court will assume a, a supranational distributive climate court role, which is completely different than what the founding father, fathers wanted in the 50s. 
Thank you. It's, there's lots of challenges for individuals, right? In some countries, they will never be successful. Okay. And if they go to Strasbourg, it seems that they would still not be successful. So <laughs> there, there seems to be um, uh, some risks there. Could we take a question from, uh, from our president, President of Aleo, please? I would like to ask a question coming back both to this opposition individual versus distributional um, jurisdiction and also to the question that was asked on this real or false dichotomy between technology and democracy. And the question is the following. To which extent are we dealing here, in the case of climate change, with something that can be, uh, uh, that is certainly a crisis, but that can be solved at any of the three levels of the traditional liberal democratic system, at the executive, at the legislative, or at the juridical level. And I'm going to take the example of what happened, for example, with the pandemic. Now, what happened, we, what did our countries, our governments do under a particularly immediate urgency? Now, climate change is a similarly immediate, but probably less absolutely direct, uh, uh, so it affects less directly the, the pure existence of each now living individual. And our countries, our governments, established task forces, that is they basically relied on what we call science advice, which is great, of course, for us at ALEA because this is our job, so we are particularly uh, so happy about this decision. But the, the question I would like to ask is how do you, as specialists in climate change, see precisely this tension in this respect? So wouldn't it be much easier, instead of asking whether the European Court of Human Rights has at all the jurisdiction to decide, actually to, to, to shortcut, as it were, this type of uh, distribution of competences and actually rely on a kind of agreement, which we might call science advice, between the technology, and I understand under technology the experts, and the executive power, that is the government itself, which is basically what happened with, with good or bad effects. I would say all in, all in all with good effects in, recent, in the recent pandemic. Thank you. Maybe we could get a round of reflections on, on this question. Um, who would like to uh, start? Okay, everyone's looking at me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been peer pressured into it. Um, I guess I would say I, I'm not in a position to argue from um, a, a theoretical perspective which, um, which branch of government um, or governance is, is best designed to deal with the problem. All I can see is that no individual sector of our societies has dealt with the situation adequately. And I think, uh, I think broadening the scope, which is what I think bringing climate change to the courts aims to do, um, is an incredibly valuable thing. So I don't think that should necessarily replace action in other spheres. But as an additional um, means, and perhaps one which intersects with those um, other means, I think it could be very useful. Well, the aspect I'd like to add is the following. Um, to be honest, I don't really uh, see or, do, or don't even understand this opposition of individual or distributive perspective, given what I said um, on the need to balance different spheres of freedom. This opposition is in a way based on a bipolar idea of law, not on a multipolar idea of law, which I would like to follow, which sees public authorities as institutions that have to balance different spheres of freedom and not see legal cases as um, individual X versus the big state but see it as uh, there, there are parliaments that have to make decisions and executive authorities that have to concretize them. And given that they leave um, uh, their, their leeway or that they violate their leeway, um, then the, the courts get in. <coughs> given that, the overall idea remains how, um, what is the best way to protect our freedom and our preconditions of freedom in the long run. And I'm pretty much convinced 
that a democracy with balance of powers is still the best way. Of course, we also have this discussion on eco-dictatorship, yeah, that in a way Hans Jonas started uh, more than 40 years ago, saying, okay, parliaments are too slow. But just take it back to philosophy. Uh, who tells you that there is this, this uh, literally altruistic dictator? Yeah? It, I've never seen someone like that. So we have to rely on parliaments. We have to rely on international col uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation. Of course, it would be much easier if we had global liberal democratic institutions. But as you all know, um, all over history, we most of the time had authoritarian governments, and even today, yeah, uh, where all the dictators uh, started calling them uh, themselves Democrats, but uh, in, in reality, yeah, an ambassador may not say that, but in the end, most countries in this world are not democratic. So um, we have to work with the institutions we have. I think this is not the right point in time for, for start uh, um, a debate about constitu uh, complete constitutional uh, reframing of what we have. Thank you, Helen. I think you get the final reflection on, on our discussion today. I think in an ideal world, parliament, government and the courts would cooperate and we should have done that much earlier. But what we see in the climate change is that for at least 40 years we know what is going on and the states have failed to do what they should do. Now the subject has arrived in society, in particular in the young society, they go on the streets, they demonstrate, and it seems to me quite natural that the issue arrives also before the courts. And the courts have now the important task to pressure the governments and the parliaments. And I hope very much that they will do that. Well, um, thank you very much for your questions online and uh, also on site uh, today. Uh, please just join me, give a big round of applause to Professor Keller and our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from, from my side, from the whole panel, also for you as a moderator. Uh, uh, this brings the official part to its conclusion and we now have to bid farewell to those who have been joining us uh, through uh, online media. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also for asking questions. Uh, bye bye Anne especially, who I know um, from previous times, but also to all others. Um, now I would ask, uh, kindly ask you to move into the other room. We will uh, uh, now clear this, these chairs and open them up for the buffet, which uh, comes out later. But we need a little bit of time and space to um, clean up uh, the rows here and put in some standing tables. So please join me then in the other room and give us a few minutes uh, until food and drinks are thirsts, as we have some food for thought, but also we have some real food coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you.